Oh, all right, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, Bill might still, because of the weather, uh, venture in, but um, welcome to our event. My name is Elizabeth King. I'm the director of the Center for Russian, East European, Eurasian Studies here at the International Institute. Um, and I'm happy to welcome you all and thank you for coming out to our event today. Before I introduce our um, event for today, I just want to um, remind you or draw your attention to the fact that next week, Chris is happy to co-sponsor uh, the Center for European Studies annual distinguished uh, lecture on Europe. It takes place Monday, December 4th from 4 to 5.30 p.m where we will be joined by Philip Ter, um, professor of Central European History at the University of Vienna, who will present his talk, Mass Flight from and in Ukraine, a game changer in international refugee and migration history. It will also take place here in this room. And now for today's big event, our um, second annual Borka Tomlinovich lecture uh, entitled Alternative Narrative, Social Knowledge of Literature in the Post-Yugoslav Cultural Field. Um, I would first like to thank uh, Dr. Katerina tomlinovich borer who's here with us today. She's Professor Emerita of Kinesiology here at University of Michigan, who uh, gave a generous gift to Kreis to establish the Borka Tomlinovich Southeast European Peace Cooperation and Conflict Fund. This lecture series honors the extraordinary life of her mother, Borka Tomlinovich, who was born and raised in Bosnia, lived in Croatia and Serbia before immigrating to the United States during the collapse of communism and the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Um, several of her books are available on the table outside. If you would like to take them, you are welcome to them as well to read more about um, uh, Dr. Borer's <laughs> mother, Borka uh, Tomlinovich. Um, today's lecture, it will address Yugoslav socialism in contemporary literature and culture after the collapse of socialism in the broader cultural, political, and economic context of Eastern Europe. We are joined and um, happy to host Dr. Kalanovic. Masha Kalanovic is an associate professor in the Department of Croatian Studies at the University of Zagreb and a multi-genre writer. Her works include the poetry collection Leeches for the Lonely, the novel Underground Barbie, the prose po um, poem Yamerica, and the short story collection Deer Pests and Other Chilling Stories, which received the 2020 European Prize for Literature, the Pula Book Fair Audience Award, and the Vladimir Nazor, Nazor Prize for Literature. Um, Dr. Kalanovic completed her um, PhD in uh, 2011 in Croatian language and comparative literature, and since has published articles on literature and popular culture. She has also co-edited various volumes looking at things like comparative post-socialism, Slavic experiences, history, text, and context, and the economy and literature. Um, and finally, Masha Kalanovic is a member of the Croatian Academy of Sciences and Art. So without further ado, I would to welcome Dr. Kalanovic to the stage. And we will have an opportunity to ask questions after the lecture, so we'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. I'm really grateful for being here. I would like to thank Katarina Borer uh, in front of Borka Tomljenovic Peace Cooperation and Conflict Fund also. Uh, Chris and uh, Dr. Elizabeth King for inviting me here. I'm really honored and happy to be here. Um, in my today lecture, um, I'll start talking about, I'll start my talk uh, reflecting some unusual Croatian souvenirs. I'm coming from Croatia, which is now after the collapse of uh, Yugoslavia, uh, mostly known as touristic uh, country with a beautiful coast, which some of you also visited, as you told me. And the most usual uh, Croatian souvenirs would be olive oil, uh, flour of salt, uh, lavender, and so on. Uh, but um, rather uh, unusual fact in representing uh, contemporary Croatia now doesn't mention anything about its socialist history as being part of socialist Yugoslavia. For example, if you're traveling with Croatia Airlines and you watch the videos uh, introducing Croatia uh, to people arriving to Croatia and you see scenes from dynamic and rich Croatian past, 
no, um, no, no pictures of no invocation of socialist part of Croatian history. Also, um, museum narratives in contemporary Croatia don't pay too much serious uh, attention to this part of history. There are some popular museums, such as Museum of the 80s, which, for example, represent one uh, flat uh, kind of preserved in the 80s, which can be in Croatia, also everywhere else. We also have a museum of uh, new wave music, but nothing seriously dedicated in serious reflection of this part of uh, uh, Croatian uh, uh, history. Uh, but um, in recent time, there was a one um, souvenir which um, invoke uh, slightly uh, this part of Croatian um, uh, history. And it was the part of young um, Croatian designers, they were called Super Studio, and they released this series of bags uh, entitled Croatia as it is. So as you can see on this picture, this bag is defining Croatia between YU and EU, YU of course short for Yugoslavia and EU short for European uh, uh, Union. Uh, and um, the slogan was slightly subver subverting this mainstream touristic narratives about Croatia, such as small, holiday, small country for big holidays, the Mediterranean as it used to be, uh, or so. And as it described on the designer's web page, uh, they described their bag in this, with these words. Politics has always been a traumatic issue in this region. Some Croatian citizens are allegedly still nostalgic about socialism, Tito, and Yugoslavia. Others are delighted Yugoslavia is no more. Some look forward to the long-awaited accession to the European Union. Others don't want to enter the EU or are afraid of it and criticize it fiercely. Be that as it may, debates and arguments on the topic make Croatia's everyday life reality. There is no consensus. Croatia's present position in time, whatever some has to say about it, it's somewhere between YU and EU, at least for a while. Um, this bag was released a um, couple years before country entered the European Union, but it was still being sold after uh, the country entered the EU, and it was pretty, for example, it was pretty cool uh, souvenir to bring for somebody uh, outside from, from Croatia. But since I was kind of following with this uh, designer's campaign, on 2018 I found an article, a newspaper, reporting an incident in the newly opened um, uh, Zagreb airport in a souvenir shop when the, when the bag was sold, and there was a one uh, angry uh, traveler protesting how Croatia, uh, how can this thing be sold in Croatia? How can this be souvenir of Croatia having these two letters representing Yugoslavia on it? And even police needed to intervene in this uh, situation. So this situation points uh, uh, their uh, still unresolved and never ending issues in remembering and articulating Yugoslavia in post Yugoslav uh, times. Also pointing to another insight uh, as one uh, anthropologist, Catherine Humphrey, um, uh, highlighted in her te text, does the category post-socialism uh, still make sense, saying there is never sudden and complete emptying of social phenomena followed by complete replacement with the new ones. And this, this case kind of points on, on, on this issue. So in my today's lecture, I will rethink some um, cultural framing of Yugoslav socialism, reflecting few selected uh, patterns from literature uh, and culture, and regarding them as a specific um, cultural repository of memory on socialism. Uh, as somebody who is researching uh, socialism in post-socialist time. Of course, this is, it is a term well established already 
in scholar research and academia. But as someone who is coming from the region, it is also a lived experience and very affectionate uh, one. And I uh, especially view on, my view on culture and literature in this sense is also regarding how literature and culture is also articulated in this sometimes very complicated uh, emotions and affections about the recent, recent past. Uh, and as an, another cultural anthropologist, Marusha Svashek, in her volume, Post-Socialism, Politics and Emotion in Eastern Europe says, uh, this era after the collapse of socialism is marked by very strong feelings ranging from hope and euphoria to disappointment, envy and disillusionment, sorrow, loneliness, and hatred. And all this is articulated through literature and culture, same something that mainstream political and economic narratives are neglecting uh, in their straightforward narratives about transition as a way to like looking forward to capital's future without any kind of doubts uh, uh, in that um, reflection. So bef before coming to my central part in viewing literature in this context, I would like to slightly um, draw the landscape of, of last 35 years, how the society and culture in special, is, in special was dealing with this memory on socialism. It is something I will of course most, mostly focused on post-Yugoslav uh, region, but there's something which is shared among other Eastern European countries. And this division, uh, this phases uh, what Eastern European in a way of um, processing and dealing with socially past, past went through is uh, reflected also by the Bulgarian film critic Temenuga Trifonova and she uh, marked three dominant phases in that process starting from the early 90s to mid to for the first decade of 2000s. She's looking at them uh, going linearly. Of course, they are going in a linear way, but I'm rather, I, I have a tendency to look at them uh, in their synchronicity. They exist simultaneously, but only maybe changing the dominant perspective in certain period. So as Temenuga Triforova uh, points, the first phase in the early 90s was the phase of denial of socialism. Socialism was reduced to totalitarianism, dictatorship, and as a society who remembers, of course, the memory is always happening in uh, as the German anthropologist Jan Asman would say, in a context. It, it depends on the social context in which it's happening. And if you change that context or the connection in that context are, are, is interrupted, then we are dealing with uh, oblivion. So in that first phase of denial as a society, we were, we were witnessing a complete um, rewriting of, of, of uh, of social, um, of, of, of social uh, attitude towards, 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 so, towards socialist past. For example, many new metaphors were being uh, used in describing that part of, now I'm saying particularly about Croatian history, for example, such as this uh, textbook, history textbooks uh, uh, for history saying, uh, that there was the chains, they were suppressing the Croats and Croatia and other conceptual metaphors such as dark past, chains, and so on were being used. Also, we were witnessing renamings of the street names and also uh, uh, devastation of uh, uh, Yugoslav anti-fascist and partisans material uh, heritage. Uh, in Croatia alone in the 90s, there were 3,000 monuments being destroyed and vandalized in certain uh, uh, ways. These are some of the iconic uh, uh, examples. This second one from Frank Kirshen, which is particularly interesting because it was destroyed with dynamite in the early 90s. Then it was moved to this uh, memory park in Brezovica when it was again 
destroyed, but uh, in this later 2000, from different reasons, from reasons of selling these raw materials and to, to, sell, uh, to, to sell it to get, to get the money. So, um, of course, um, these things of um, rewriting history, reducing it to totalitarianism, are happening in recent times. It was not just fashion in the early 90s, although in the early 90s it was a dominant tendency. But we can also see that happening in so-called more European uh, civilized ways, as former Croatian President uh, Kolinda Grabar-Kitarović removed uh, the vista of uh, Josip Broz Tito from her presidential office. But in new times, the approach is also um, more relaxed in a sort of public reaction to that uh, tendency. So like internet was kind of fully this reaction. Uh, many, many of them were like presented in a humorous way. In one of them, Tito her, himself is uh, turning on to Kolinda grabar Kitarovic saying that it wasn't for him, she would not be uh, uh, president of uh, Croatia she, since the country will be still under the Nazi regime. So uh, these things are, of course, happening also in recent uh, times, but that was, I will say, dominant tendency in the, in the 90s. In the early 90s, um, any type of pointing to other layers of social history, for example, Yugoslav modernist emancip emancipatory project or anti-fascist struggle, will be condemned as being Yugo-nostalgic, which was a politically, political stigma, a very negative term. And some of the most prominent uh, post-Yugoslav dissidents, such as Dubravka Ugresic, Boris Budan, or the crew around the satirical journal Fair and Tribute were uh, stigmatized uh, uh, with, with, this, with this name. But slowly, slightly uh, approaching to the years of 2000, uh, this nostalgia became, as Temenega Trifonova said, another, I will say, big layer in dealing with socialism after this first phase of, uh, um, of denial kind of faded. Uh, and as she said, after the denial comes the bitter sweet nostalgia. Again, Croatia as one of the country which was mostly violently treating socialist material, uh, material heritage is also a stage of one of the most prominent um, uh, uh, events of uh, Yugo nostalgia, that is the celebration of Tito's birthday in his birthplace of uh, Kumrovets, which is recently uh, renamed in Eco Village Kumrovets, completely erasing its, uh, uh, its uh, a socialist legacy and, and, and history. And uh, what is interesting about nostalgia as uh, to other anthropologists, as you can see, I love combining anthropology and, 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 and culture and literature. Maya Nadkarni and, and Olga Shevchenko pointed in their views on po politics of nostalgia. Nostalgia is not just about some uh, grief or remembers of, of past, it's also uh, it also points to what is missing and what is wrong with our present time. And as you can see, maybe some of you who knows um, the language, the, those transparents, for example, saying tvornice radnicima, it means factories to the people, are pointing uh, to the devastating uh, position of workers in today's societies with all the production uh, being, uh, being shut uh, and, and so on. So, uh, of course, nostalgia, as Dubravka Ugrešić pointed in her book of essays, Europe in Sefia, uh, be very soon became mental supermarket and capitalist culture points put its fingers on nostalgia, trying to sell it really good. And it's not just a um, trend in, in former Yugoslavia, it's a trend, of course, uh, all over the Eastern Europe. If you visit uh, any Eastern European country, uh, you will probably, you probably noticed uh, um, uh, this type of um, 
uh, contemporary articulation. Even in Western Europe, this is a picture from one cafe in London promoting also reading of Marx and, and so on, which is being um, present in this, in this uh, uh, second layer. And finally, uh, what Trifonova points as a third phase, uh, approaching more closely to our uh, recent times, is what she called the cabinet of curiosities, saying that socialism is no longer in the domain of those who lived in that area, who remembers it, and saying, no, I know what, how it was back then, your truth is not right, I was the victim, or so on. It, it became history, inviting new generations born long after uh, this period to research this, uh, this era, and in that uh, sense, many new approaches are now uh, being, um, uh, being present, not just in the region, but also uh, uh, everywhere uh, outside the region, which are researching uh, uh, not, just, not just the big narratives of socialism, but also everyday life, c popular culture, and so on, which was accompanied also with many documentaries from uh, also dedicated to, to that period and, and, and so on. So in that slightly parallel with that era when there is more relaxed, generally more relaxed approach to socialism uh, in, the, in the region, um, uh, there is a notable tendency of literature also reflecting that period, especially novels, which I found as a genre very interesting because novels are always, uh, as uh, Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin pointed out, is in close tension and dialogue with everyday, with everyday uh, uh, life and surrounding contexts. So in the rest of my uh, presentation, I will point to some representative narratives, uh, how uh, contemporary post-Yugoslav novels are dealing with socialist past. Of course, I could take these, these examples, which I will refer to are of course, partly my subjective choice, the writers that I prefer or find interesting. Uh, I will try to not exhaust, exhaust in, in many, as many examples of it, but just to point on possible model of looking how literature in its specific ways deals with the socialist uh, past. And I will look at those narratives uh, as um, uh, narratologist Mika Ball will point it as effectively colored, surrounded by an emotional aura that precisely makes them uh, memorable. Uh, I would say that those narratives preserve specific mode, tonality, affection in remembering uh, uh, socialism, offering us different type of knowledge, which, is, which are those mainstream narratives are uh, offering. And as French philosopher Jean Crancier would put it, they're producing specific politics of aesthetics, but not politics in its uh, narrow, maybe trivial meaning, but politics is how are they arranging certain motives, which one they are stressing out, which point of view, which point of focalization they are using, uh, how they're distinguishing uh, what is being presented, what is ne neglected. That is all in serve of creating specific politics of aesthetics in remembering socialism after its, its collapse. So in, in, this, uh, in this view, I will say that um, uh, in this analytical optic uh, and in this hierarchy of uh, intentions of emotions, on the first place I will point the novel Ministry of Pain, one, pain one from, I will say, the most prominent post-Yugoslav writer Dubravka Ugrešić. Uh, maybe you are, many of you are familiar with this uh, novel, which is narrated in mostly in the first person narration by 
professor character whose name is Professor Tanya Lucic, uh, who uh, after the war broke in Yugoslavia, went to Netherlands, teaches Slavic literatures, and most of her class is, uh, uh, is uh, her class are, is the, the pupils in her class are mostly refugees from former Yugoslavia or students who are dealing with this big big loss and what they're experiencing in that class kind of processing with their professor is the breakup of the normative and narrative aspects of the connective structures that create their identities their sense of belonging and the possibility of cohesive pronoun we and what literature does, uh, especially this novel, in the sense of narration, is constantly fluctuating between I and we, between personal and the political, between the community and individual experience. And I find this um, part of the text uh, representative uh, to you to show how this strategy works in the text. I will quote. My pupils also consented to begin their sentences with our people part of the time, though none of us quite knew what it mean and refused other time as if it entitled some real concrete danger. And when we refused, we refused to belong to either our people down there or our people up here. There were times when we accepted our fuzzy collective identity and time when we rejected it in disgust. Over and over I hear people say it's not my war and it wasn't our war, but it was our war too. Because if it hadn't been our war too, we wouldn't have been here now. Because if it had been our war, we wouldn't have been here either. So we see how in this sophisticated way literature narrates about this uh, interruption in this connection, connective structures, what, 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 what uh, actually what creates one community. And uh, Professor Lucic, the main character and the narrator of this novel, is trying to process this schizophrenic situation with her students by the act of remembering Yugoslavia, by the act of remembering all those small things which were making their everyday life in uh, uh, the former country. Uh, and the, 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 I will say the main effect of that remembrance is nostalgia. Nostalgia uh, of, of a loss of individual uh, memories, loss of, of, of time, of, of a certain individual in certain time and uh, attempt to preserve that memory by writing down uh, those uh, 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 small catalogs of, of material culture and individual memories surrounding it. That will be uh, when we speak about nostalgia uh, as uh, Svetlana Boim, one prominent um, uh, uh, a Russian theorist uh, would say would be re reflexive nostalgia, not restorative nostalgia, with no attempt to make new Yugoslavia again, but not to forget it. So I will say this affection of nostalgic, uh, painful uh, effect of this novel, it's, it stands on the top of the hierarchy of affects in this sense. I will now point to my second example, which use similar strategies in a formal way of narration. That is the novel by um, uh, uh, writer Goran Tripuson, uh, which is called uh, God Forbid, Neda Obog Vecek Zla, which is also presented, narrated dominantly in the first person narration. Main character remember all the things he grew up within Yugoslavia. But the main difference, such as, of course, fashion, food, uh, music, uh, political rituals, and so on. But the main difference uh, in producing this different affection uh, in remembering is that the narrator is avoiding the fact of Yugoslavia dissolution. So there is no reflection of Yugoslavia's end. And we have uh, then completely another tonality in this remembrance. That is the tonality of, of humor, of good laugh, and the popularity of this uh, novel was also rebuilt with a TV show and movie made by 
directed by Snežana Tribuson, where all those uh, things uh, uh, were even most uh, were more prominent in sense of pop pop culture. Uh, my third example uh, is a new now new situation. In a, we can go like like this with many many examples, but I of course uh, don't have time for this. This is just my offer of the possible model in, in reflecting those issues. But my third example uh, is the novel, uh, translated uh, into English, is a novel but also one of the very prominent post-Yugoslav authors, Miljenko Jergovic, uh, in, uh, in um, whose works Yugoslavia takes very prominent topic. And uh, I'm taking here the example of his novel, Walnut Mansion, uh, where socialism is not in prim primal focus of the narration. It's a novel about the whole 20th century uh, in the region, but socialism takes one uh, uh, particular part in, in that um, narration. And that novel is a narrated in third person narration, where narrator is not one of the characters who is outside of the events of the characters uh, experiencing uh, in the novel. And as such, he doesn't have uh, emotional affection on the world about his narrating. And that uh, narration, since it's made by this, uh, we will say, old uh, uh, as, a, as a narration who has this complete insight of the 20th century history and also knows what will happen to Yugoslavia, is producing specific ironic and little bit cynical stance to the historical events uh, which characters are experiencing in the novel. And this uh, example, which I will quote, is describing the dead, death of Josip Broz Tito in that uh, uh, particular moment uh, in the novel, where the narrator is describing just just a little bit before Tito died, the situation in the country uh, with um, this description. In all the churches of the city, people said heartfelt prayers for Tito's recovery, urging the Almighty to make allowances for one atheist, and God was already supposed to know why he should act on their request. In creating a man, God created competition for himself. If he didn't listen to the praise for Tito recovery, he would soon see for himself what kind of monster his most perfect creations could turn into. So this narrator has this privilege to be ironic upon the socialist um, history since he knows the later procedure of the events which follows. And what is also interesting in terms of narration of this novel, that uh, it's narrated uh, from uh, the, it goes further in the past. It, it, it starts from the contemporary point of view and the, yeah, the, the, the go, we, we go more further in the novel, we are, go, we are going more further in the past. And as Stephen Dyke uh, stressed out in the foreword of the English translation of Jergovic's novels, the reverse chronology of the novel is oddly suitable for outside readers, the majority of whom first learned about Yugoslavia at its bloody end and only slowly worked their way backward to learn the history of the country. So in these two, three examples, which I took, and I'm kind of making this fence of saying these are, for me, very uh, uh, interesting examples, which are pointing to this tonality of nostalgia, humor, and, and, and irony, are offering, uh, are representable for this specific view of fiction on history, and are offering what um, Czech uh, sociologist Jan Vanya would say approach of looking at cultural meanings in a society of a given time and space through the lenses of literary fiction. Uh, of course, we can um, uh, go more further in the context, find those patterns of nostalgia, humorous nostalgia, such as the famous movie Goodbye Lenin, or, or looking for other types of narratives about socialism in, 
in broader Eastern European uh, 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 context. And all of them, as highlighted by Vanya in his text, are pointing uh, to literature as a way to grasp the emotional subjective and tacit aspects of social experience which are prone to slip unnoticed by the sociological analysis. Literary is a way to access a deeper understanding of social phenomena which is representative of the collective life in a broader socio-historical milieu. The former channels the existential understanding of social experience where the latter anchors this experience in more general cultural patterns of social life, for example, what we usually understand by the term zeitgeist. Of course, as German writer Christa Wolff would put it, we will, not, we, we will not learn history from literature, but literature can offer uh, insights that history document sometimes cannot uh, uh, articulate. And um, of course that each piece of this literary work uh, doesn't have the pretension to be truthful uh, per se, to be the dominant point. But if we are looking at them in a certain mosaic, we can get a more complex view on the era which is presented and articulated through all those aspects of individuality, emotions, um, and uh, in the individual destiny in a, in a certain social um, context. And I, when I was reflecting all those examples and also covering some others which I didn't mention today, I realized that they're all kind of narrating about Yugoslavia uh, in a sense of past of something which is done, which is, which, is, which is over, treating a bit Yugoslavia as one of the exhibits of um, what we have in Croatia. It's called Museum of the Broken Relationships. It's, uh, that it's a museum where couples, after the breakup, bring certain artifact from their relationship, and then they wrote a little story about it, what they're meant, what this artifact meant to them. So, in a way, those novels are treating Yugoslavia as in a past tense, as something uh, which doesn't have future. And um, also, uh, in that sense, um, uh, one, uh, these are the writers from like uh, now uh, more older generation. I found that also in the new writing, such as in the works of uh, Lana Bastasic, uh, also very prominent post-Yugoslav figure of the uh, new generation of writers. And from her novel, Catch the Rabbit, she's describing uh, particularly that situation of encounter with Yugoslavia as an artifact in the museum of Avno in Javce, Jajce, which is uh, memorizing this act of, 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 of forming the country. And those two young characters, we, who were uh, children in the time when uh, Yugoslavia, when the war broke in Yugoslavia, are visiting this museum in a hope they will find something which will fulfill this puzzle of memory in the sense of their identities, of being born in one country which disintegrated, which separate their lives, which in, 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 where in this dissolution many crimes were committed among people. And coming to this museum, they're expecting maybe a catharsis, but after end, there's no such thing as catharsis. And this is a rather larger expert from um, this novel. I can only uh, read the um, last part of it, which I find very interesting uh, and uh, representative in this sort. In this absurd room, she looked like a child. No one had come to her party. The seats were empty. The plaster was peeling from the walls. Plastic Disneyland, immature, compared to the tales that preceded it, Yugoslavia, the Happy Meal version. So Yugoslavia is, as from the narrator's point of view, is this critically apostrophized uh, as a redu reduction in a, just one material uh, artifact uh, in, this, in, this, in this novel. 
But let me go back to these layers of, of memory which I referred to from the beginning of my lecture when I um, was pointing to Temenuga Trifonova. She ended her, she published her art articles in the first decade of the 2000s, so she stopped on this period of so-called cabinet of curiosities. But going more deeper into our contemporary capitalist now in, in the region, uh, and looking, kind of tracing these puncts of memory in the cultural arena, uh, I'm there to say there's like a new layers being out there, which I called uh, the revolutionary quality of socialism in questioning capitalism. I, I put a question mark because it's still something which is ascending. But there are, uh, on the margins of culture, uh, in pop culture, tendentions which are using and pointing to socialist history as something which is very prominent in our today's society, in our capitalist now, invoking Yugoslavia not as a dead fact, but as a project to be reconsidered. For example, this group of uh, authors gather in the collective active are uh, evoking for this impossible project of Yugoslavia, reflecting how it possible, it seems, that one country could produce genuine anti-fascist movements during the World War II and saying that those resources of that revolutionary potential must be brought to unpresent uh, uh, time. So many examples of this sort can be traced when potential of imagining socialism is being brought up in some new uh, cultural tendency. Uh, and as art theorist Susan Buck Morse post uh, points in her article about post-Soviet condition in the book called East Art Map, reflecting the art from Eastern Euro Europe in recent days, she says, as for socialism, we have not heard the last of it. Socialism will be back in some new form as a creative idea, not because of any logic of history, but because material conditions will demand its rediscovery. It will have to be reimagined as a response to material existing conditions, because the growing gap between rich and poor, the deep contradiction between public and private interest, the ecological disasters of the present forms of production and consumption will not automatically disappear as a result of the end of Western dominance. And with these thoughts, I will uh, end my uh, lecture, hoping we can discuss some of this issue in Q&A. Thank you for your attention. Uh, hello, I just have a very question to start up our discussion maybe. Uh, when you started your lecture, you mentioned that there is uh, the such souvenirs uh, you, between you and um, EU. I just wonder, are there any similar souvenirs with the same like symbolics in other countries of the former Yugoslavia? And if there is no, are there any special preconditions that you might think that uh, lead uh, like Croatia to have these mm -hmm. uh, souvenirs mm -hmm. in your country? Yeah, of course, even though I spoke about a region in general, there are nuances in dealing with uh, past, uh, some like particular nuances in each country. And Croatia is, of course, specific because of the war where this uh, trauma was like more uh, present uh, in sense of uh, uh, putting guilt on Yugoslav National Army. Uh, for uh, for as yes, being the aggressor in the war and taking this position, so Yugoslavia is uh, in Croatia is particularly, I will say, um, neutral and like not so into much, uh, not so many. There's no big offer of souvenirs about Yugoslavia in Croatia. That's how I started. Uh, I notice more of them 
in Slovenia, in Serbia, but yes, Croatia is, I would say, from my point of view, uh, kind of, yeah, uh, neglecting this part of, of history also in this public articulation. Mm -hmm. uh, could this um, nostalgia for socialism be part of the uh, different history of um, uh, uh, citizens of Yugoslavia being um, independent uh, financially or willing to assume responsibility. I mean, socialism gave free education, free food, you know, <laughs> very cheap food and stuff like that. It was kind of covering up for lots of repressions and okay. other things that were not desirable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people may <coughs> basically say, you know, now we have this inequality in um, employment and uh, countries that have had longer history of capitalism mm -hmm. or personal responsibility probably would not have this tendency to mm -hmm. hang on the memories mm -hmm. of free food, cheap bread, uh, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, so I don't know, you know how to interpret uh, yeah. the, the, these nostalgia mm -hmm. waves back and forth. Yeah. Uh, certainly nostalgia, in my opinion, and the reason this talk was organized, is that a country that had the resources unevenly distributed lived in a conglomerate where you know they could balance and provide different resources to keep the economy going and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, it probably dissolved because of irreconcilable differences in culture, religion, mm -hmm. and history. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, I. I'm hearing what you are saying, but I'm not sure I understand really mm -hmm. what the root of that mm -hmm. is. You showed that one picture where people were mm -hmm. saying lots of unemployed people and you know the workers are not getting jobs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's not unique to this part of the world, mm -hmm. but there is a history here uh, since you know the, the Russian Revolution mm -hmm. and, and really the uh, mm -hmm. exposure to mm -hmm. socialism which is in a way pernicious because mm -hmm. people were used to getting things mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. without effort and mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. being responsible for mm -hmm. creating something else. I mean, again, I, I say that all because um, I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> so um, anyway. Yeah, th thank you for your question and your comment. Uh, I will say there are m many different layers of nostalgia and of course economical Economic is like really one really important to consider in this practice, especially as we are going further to capitalism. For example, students of mine who don't have experience of living in socialism are evoking the idea of free education and free public health as some social values which needed to be preserved. And they, they evoke, not just in that, for example, also in a way of urban planning. They, for example, uh, saw like a reasonable urban planning uh, where uh, when, when the urban planning is dedicated to the citizens, not to the profit. And they evoke such things going further in, cap in capitalism. Of course, in the, in the early 90s, that was also a subversive gesture of, uh, to, the, to the dominant layer of confiscating socialist past as being just reduction to totalitarian dicta dictatorship, just reducing it yet to that moment. So in that early 90s, it had that, that layer, but going more further to, the, to capitalism when production is devastated, especially, yes, on those pictures, there was this woman holding these work factories to the workers. Women were specific, specifically uh, in danger in a textile factory, which are all shut down no work, uh, no, no benefits. And then this, this, of course, economic layer of evoking what was before in a, in a, in a way of good social 
values, good social infrastructure and, and, and culture. So I will say there are many layers also depending on the period, even though these 35 years might seem homogeneous, actually they, they are and there are many la layers also in these 35 years. Uh, but of course, those all, all of the aspect you, aspects you mentioned are important in understanding nostalgia in that period. Good evening. <coughs> My name is Eureka Parulin. I'm uh, Wiser Center Fellow. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, the process of uh, decommunization or de-socialization. So, uh, in many countries after the socialism. Um, government uh, organized the process of, of decommunization and destitalization. In some countries it, it was successful, in some countries now. Uh, can you uh, tell more about this process in Croatia? I, I, if uh, is it was some organized process or chaotic <laughs> process, and how it's possibly affected <laughs> on uh, the region of, of the past? Thank you. Okay, th thank you for your question. Uh, uh, I might not be an um, expert to, to say what is like, how this uh, process was going on, like from the point of view of somebody who is from political science or, or uh, economics. But uh, what is being done like that in the 90s, it was like um, going on in a really, I will say, uh, abrupt, non-organized, manner with lots of corruption, uh, where those effects against socialism were being used. I'm now we're speaking about cultural layer of, of that sort. And what we also witness is, uh, witness it, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm, I'm reading political docu document as somebody who is, who is a writer, who is a literature professor, but that is also interesting f thing for me. So I read, for example, some strategies uh, about national uh, policy of encouraging, for example, uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in Croatia, and they were stigmatizing socialism through all these stereotypes. Oh, people used used to expect that uh, society will take care of them. No, now they need to take their own initiative. But uh, there were also many corruption using political power. Uh, where people were using to their own private interests. We still have uh, many politicians in jail because of that, which is actually a good thing that they're in jail. That means that some things are <laughs> still working. So uh, this pro process is going like very difficult, I will say, very unorganized, uh, very abru abruptly, especially it was like more wild in the early period of the, uh, of, of the 90s. I hope I, <laughs> I gave some kind of an answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your talk. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a little further about the layers of, the, of uh, the politics of the visual culture, the way these, 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 the visuals of the communist period are brought into contemporary culture. Um, because I, it seems to me that in the former Yugoslavia and in Central Europe, we see um, a different use of this visual of the, the iconography of communism and socialism than what we than what Svetlana Boim was writing about in the immediate post-Soviet period in Russia, uh, where everything was simultaneously mm -hmm. ironic and non-ironic, mm -hmm. um, which I think she she writes about beautifully. But in in places like Poland and the Czech Republic, um, the interest in images like the star or mm -hmm. other icons icons of socialism are presented there's a there's an intense interest in in these things generally from a purely aesthetic viewpoint there's almost no association with the social constructs or institutions of state socialism mm -hmm. and and so you have people who use who are very interested in this visual iconography aesthetically from a from a design perspective, so you have all these catalogs of like um, neon signs and things like that from the socialist period, and people actually trying to collect this stuff, and then you have the the young ironic um, iconography, where you use the exact same image, but it's really to evoke your sense of being young and above it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if you see the same layers in the former Yugoslavia, and also whether there is um, any discomfort 
with the ways in which the same symbols could just as easily be treated as symbols of state violence. Mm -hmm. um, and this it really comes from a, a conversation that was happening very much in our professional conferences 15, 20 years ago about um, people wearing hammer and sickle t-shirts mm -hmm. when you would never see someone wearing a swastika t-shirt. And the common explanation was de-Stalinization happened and the Soviet Union went on, but denazification did not happen with the continued existence of a Nazi regime. But I don't know that that's, after your, I've been satisfied with that answer for so long, and after your talk, I don't know that I'm satisfied with that answer anymore. Um, because it seems to me that there are people who are using these images without any interest at all in uh, life under these conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 really a, a good good observation and think uh, a topic to think about it. And I will also see many layers in it, and especially looking like more micros microscopically uh, in the region. Because, for example, in Croatia, you have you you basically still have Ustasha, that's basically domestic uh, Nazis signs all over the place, and uh, like. Yeah, on the hats, on the graffiti, on the kids' playground, and it's uh, something which people uh, still don't don't take it like as a, as a, as something which which is terrible, which needs to be uh, which needs to be like seriously uh, reconsidered, and, it, and it's everywhere. So uh, with 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 this with this sense, we are st uh, in, in in case of Yugoslavia, there's this, this uh, um, great scholar from Ljubljana, Mitya Velikonja. He has this book about graffiti, and he reflects also graffitis about Yugoslavia. He traveled uh, all over Yugoslavia and found find uh, many what he called cultural wars graffiti about. Yugoslavia, somebody like invoking it, somebody saying it was like no Yugoslavia, and that's what we can still see on our streets. That's why I recall these are still unresolved issues in the region, and you never know what's the next what's the next move. Uh, you think, okay, we now come to the another phase, but then like you have another another subject, another issue popping up with just living history, no serious reflection of history in the public space. Like I said, we have popular culture museum of, I don't know, of the 80s, but no serious reflection of the history. Sometimes when I speak about that, somebody said, come on, it won't solve. Uh, even if we have a serious museum about it, we will still be kind of in this uh, uh, tensions, but I don't think so. I, I think the more, comp I, I believe in these small steps of complex reflection of, 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 of things. So in the region, those wars are still, still going, going on. Yeah. I took some of the example of some more prominent, like artistic, uh, self-aware representation, but there's like all layer of street signs, street graffiti, which are uh, taking this battle. Yeah. Thank you. Can you speak to the the interplay before, during uh, socialism and after of religion. So religion has s sort of the, 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 the construct of, in, in, gen in general, I know you're, you're talking of Croatia, which is primarily, if I may say, yeah, yeah. Catholic, but of Yugoslavia, it was an amalgam of, of all these very desperate religions with, mm -hmm. with um, Orthodox mm -hmm. Christianity and and, and Muslim and, and Jews, which were, were badly eradicated in the World War II. Um, but just the context, maybe if it's in literature, what have you, of almost each of the religions is about providing for those in need and, and giving and sort of maybe criticizing or looking harshly at the rich capitalism. So I don't know if that's appropriate as a question. <laughs> Of course, um, religion structures uh, in former Yugoslavia, maybe I can speak more about Croatia's situation, are hostile towards socialism and communism because they felt they were suppressed in the, in the era. 
but uh, as you say, I also see a common interest or goal in, in taking care of the ones who are most in, in need, that is, <laughs> now we're speaking about imagining this new socialism as Susan Book Morse uh, uh, articulated and did that. But in, in mainstream narratives in Croatia from the Catholic Church, they are like dominantly hostile against, like they're just basically functioning in this conceptual metaphor of something wrong, of something, of something evil. That is still this, I will say, this tra traumatic issues, from the period being resolved, uh, yes, but not being creative and sense of thinking, like combining you know, what you <laughs> you mentioned and apostrophe in that sense of taking care of the the most uh, uh, the one who are most in, in in need. But that is that is dominant narrative still, yeah. In terms of religious <laughs> elites, there are people who things differently, but dominant narratives of, of religious elites are like that. Hi. Um, so I have, now that you mentioned museums, I, um, I was just wondering, uh, uh, what do you think, what are your thoughts on the Museum of Yugoslavia in Belgrade? Um, like whether, do you feel like this is a serious space where some of these questions, right, of memory, of historiography can be opened up? Um, I mean, I know that their programming is, is relatively limited, but I was just wondering like, what you think about mm -hmm. what they're doing, the kind of uh, you know, cultural or political or, or histor mm -hmm. historical work that they're um, mm -hmm. doing. And also they changed recently, well, in relatively recently, their name from like the Museum of History of Yugoslavia, right, to the Museum of Yugoslavia. So, so I was just wondering what you thought about them. Yeah, I, um, I also cannot sp speak like very relevantly because uh, I'm not that often in, in, in Belgrade, but I, would, I will point it, what they do, wh what they exhibit and their publication. I think they're doing good work in, in trying to uh, uh, release this stigma of, of Yugoslavia uh, as a subject uh, of reflection. So, for example, we don't, in Croatia, there is no such thing on a state level. There are like, there is some, like I said, Popius Museum, there's one also in Dubrovnik I forgot to mention. And so, but I think they are doing more serious stuff than these others. So I think they're gathering researchers in a way they're trying to uh, make things more relevant and, and complex, yes. But maybe somebody who is following like their work with like every exhibition can can give you maybe more relevant answer. Yes, I was just wondering if you are teaching a course in uh, 20th century uh, Yugoslav history, and you deal with uh, Tito. How do you discuss Tito and his era? I'm, I'm teaching a literature. I'm teaching literature of that period, and I always try to point like I kind of show you my, in a small way, my model of of, of teaching, showing this complexity of the text and the complexity of the view. So when I'm teaching the year, I'm trying to also include all those different perspectives which literature can offer, and I think that literature is a great methodological tool in learning uh, and um, understanding complexity of the phenomena, not put anything into rigid frames. So that's, <laughs> that's why I'm not like a hardcore historian, but uh, I'm doing um, a history of literature, trying to, to show this uh, 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 mosaic perspective and what narration about certain things can teach us, uh, just getting more into the perspective of the other. And I think literature is perfect for that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask a slightly um, peripheral question, but mm -hmm. one that you know is close to my heart and my mother's heart. And that is, um, does the literature reflect in some way um, the hatreds and the antagonisms between the states that really got at each other's throats uh, when the Yugoslavia fell apart. 
and the literature probably should have some such biases. I, I'm sure that Serbian literature does not uh, glorify Croatian literature and vice versa. And you know, I, I know that this is not what you're talking about. You're, you're talking yeah. about Croatian literature, but this is sort of a hot spot because there are cultural, religious, and historical and political mm -hmm. reasons why these hatreds still mm -hmm. simmer around. And that may be somehow connected with these uh, fascist signs that mm -hmm. you say still exist mm -hmm. around Croatia. I mean, Croatia mm -hmm. was a mm -hmm. quizzling state, mm -hmm. uh, joint, you know, of course, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, t thank you for this insight. Of course, I'm not ideal uh, idealizing literature that it's only promoting uh, noble stuff, peace. And of course, there are antagonism and, and speech, uh, hate speech, in literature. But I just. I don't think it's good literature. <laughs> and I mean, it's also literature to to be read, to critically be taught. Uh, there are also books about socialism who are really reducing the perspective on it. I didn't mention them right now. Literature is also complex as humans are complex. And of course, there are those perspectives as well, which heat up the, 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 the hate. But uh, what I found progressive in literature, uh, I try to put focus uh, on, on, on that. I'm curious why the, what seemed to be almost completely shared language uh, of Yugoslavia has now become something that each of the ethnic groups that formed new uh, political identities insist are different from each other. Why isn't Serbian and Croatian uh, a, the same language, simply with different dialects. <laughs> Thank you for your question. It's something that is, that's been irritating nationalists nationalist in the region for so many, for so many years, uh, years. I also believe the language should be a source of bridging things together, because I can perfectly understand and read Serbian, Bosnian, Montenegrin, uh, authors, and that is also my, my point of view, that we should not take the language as a tool of d d distinction. Now it's, like you said, why it's like that, it's just policies of the new countries name the languages uh, as that, and they are developing now with less connection in the region in a different, different ways, but those differences are, especially if you are looking at it from other uh, pers 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 perspective, uh, are minor in sense of uh, understanding, and I think uh, especially literature uh, needs to be bridge. I will say in this, I will say progressive tool as a, as a tool of, of, of bridging cultures in the region. And some writers really did that, and there were like some initiatives about uh, common language in that sense, and also uh, events which are hosting writers from the region, some projects which are have this as a statement. Taking language and literature as something which connects us, not divides us, and don't want to be instrumentalized in this sense of di division. Yeah, and that's also my po point of view on li literature and, and, and language. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, and it was prompted by one of your photos, um, and it looked like it was in Umag, um, in Istria. And I was wondering, obviously most of the kind of culture industry is centered in Zagreb, logistically. Um, but what, to what degree they're kind of localized inflections of these alternative narratives outside of Zagreb that are very specific to kind of geographically distinct cultural histories, like mm -hmm. in Istria um, and in cities like Rijeka or in Dalmatia, Split, Dubrovnik, how, like what kind of regional literature do you see coming out of these um, recent cultural production that is specifically invoking this kind of alternative socialist history? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, there are regional differences, even in the small space like, uh, like Croatia is. 
And Istria will be, in that sense, uh, uh, the most uh, openly progressive as well, speaking about socialist heritage, still not erasing some, some signs and still cultivating uh, this idea, especially of anti-fascism. Um, but in, um, I will say it has to also do with the consequences of, of war, like I said, where the regions in Croatia were, which were more um, wounded by war have, have this more hostility towards socialist symbols like, I don't know, central Dal Dalmatia uh, and so. But Istria is really an uh, exception, I will say, in the sense of openly articulating and preserving this, this heritage. And that's a good insight. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thank you for speaking. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about kind of getting over this neglect of the socialist history and moving towards an acknowledgement, um, we've talked about like museums, um, and I'm curious to know if you think that is like the, the best way to, to acknowledge it, um, whether, I mean, compared to alternatives in education or literature or monuments, and then also, considering that Croatia is a very touristic country now, and you know its economy does, or tourism is a big part of the economy at this point, is there a difference in the way, or is it problematic if there is a difference in the way that this history is presented outward versus inwardly, in terms of like how Croatians will talk about this history versus how it's talked about on like a global, um, on a global scale, or? from that perspective. Is there a difference or should there be or is that problematic? Yeah, good, <laughs> good question. Um, in sort of uh, thinking about yeah, maybe some f future tendencies, but I took those examples as some of the most prominent examples of reflecting memory. I think not the role is, the burden should not be just put on the museums, of course, it should, should be put in education, what I think as a critical, progressive uh, education. Uh, but museums are this kind of first visible step in one community. It's not just seeing the exhibits, it's also sometimes the kind of the cultural magnet of all the different events and discussion, at least from my point of view, it should be. But uh, there also, as you noticed, uh, their place for, I don't know, tourist visits. And those museums I mentioned, speaking about Croatia uh, uh, only, are, um, I would say, articulated for tourist gaze, kind of confirming this stereotype about uh, just showing the surface of fashion, food, and music, not kind of connecting it to what are those, what is happening now in the region, what are kind of deeper layer to reflect. I know that's maybe too ambitious for one tourist representation, but not just for tourists, because people also from the country, the school, the pupils will visit those, those museums. They can generate some different things than just stereotypes about certain, about certain Things. So maybe I'm putting too much burden on, on those, but like I, like I point to Susan Buck Morse, there is still a little bit of my utopian thinking in imagination. I think at least imagining new progressive things that would help uh, just being uh, more tolerant, uh, more reflective towards certain things would help, will help to, to the nations. Thank you. All right, we can thank you so much, uh, Masha, mm -hmm. for your lecture and for answering mm -hmm. all of our questions. We really covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so thank you very much for joining us here in Michigan. Thank you so much for coming and for like for questions. And thank you.